So Gerald Oxenen, he's here. He's a project manager for Data Central, and he's um, his background is really interesting. So he does a lot of major projects, so really deep dives into certain areas. And he'll talk about that while he's going through his presentation. He'll be the first person up, so he'll have about 20 minutes to go through his presentation. And then after that, we're going to dovetail into a lot of the people that you can see right now and some others that will be on a little later that will talk about some of the areas that he'll bring up in his, um, in, you know, in his presentation. And as you saw, many of you saw what the list is. So Ghost Kitchens is one we'll definitely get into, probably get into some uh, automation technology areas, but consumer demands and behaviors and how that's changed. So right now we've got uh, Luis Arrow, as you can see, he's the Director of Culinary Operations for Logan's Roadhouse. They've been extremely successful in the area of Ghost Kitchens and Virtual Kitchens. So he'll definitely be chiming in about what they did and how successful they were uh, during the pandemic and what's still happening today in that. Alex Sadowski um, is with us and he'll talk about, I mean, they're just like killing. I mean, their numbers are off the charts. And it's uh, it's exciting to hear that, you know, and, and, and things that they're doing there. Um, Dave Woolley will be on. He was in a meeting, so he, he should be on pretty soon with us. Oh, he's here now. Um, so Dave's going to be with us. Of course, he'll talk about Inspire Brands, but mostly about Buffalo Wild Wings and some of the things that are going on with them. Um, and then uh, Eric Justice will join us later. He's a uh, creative culinary director for Plein Air. So, and then again, anybody else out there that wants to come on and talk about something that's significant that you want to share with the group, just uh, please put it in the chat room. I had a friend come back from Colorado, RJ, and they were skiing uh, and had like tons of snow. That it was a whiteout. He couldn't even see coming down the slopes. And so it, was cool. it was the last two weeks have been absolutely insane. Not just snow, but sub-zero temperatures. It was like negative Ooh. six, like three days back to back to back. Well, you know, we're looking at everybody knows all the negatives happening in our industry. And I, I that's what we kind of talked about. It's like, all right, what's the positive? Let's let's take this hour and really talk about things that are happening that are good um, and what we can build on and 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 go from there. So uh, that being said, let's just start. Gerald, why don't, you're on. Why don't you bring your slides up and let's get started with that. Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for having me today. If you're just joining, my name is Gerald Oaksonen, and I'm from Data Central, where I work on the content team and produce research like we'll see today. And I'm really excited to share with you some fresh insights on recent shifts in the food service landscape. So today we're going to cover this evolving landscape, as well as look at some new trends in technology, automation, ghost, and ghost kitchens. All this research comes from recent data central reports, which are available in our new Netflix-esque offering, Report Pro. So let's dive in. And we'll start first with a look at our current consumer landscape. Just a quick note, all the data we're about to see is representative of the entire US gen pop. We'll also see many generational consumer breakouts, as well as trended data from several years back too, just to see how much landscape has changed in this uh, short time frame. So to begin, here we see the broad diets practiced by Americans. Overall, most consumers, well over half, overtly identify as meat, meat eaters, although we have seen this decrease even in just the last uh, year by quite a bit. And then really, most of these other diets don't really capture too much of a share overall, although we do see that the raw foods diet has grown to outpace even vegetarian, vegetarianism and veganism, which is fascinating and perhaps something to keep an eye on. Oops. Okay, and then on this one, we have allergen avoidance. Here we ask consumers, do you avoid eating any of these things? In all cases, consumers have rapidly increased their avoidance of these common allergens. And on the right, we see this question trended and observe that the practice of allergen avoidance has risen dramatically since 2017. Then on the left, we see that it's the younger consumers, predominantly millennials, that are the main adherents of this avoidance. And really one cause I could see being a contributor to this growing trend is just more labeling and messaging about label or about allergen inclusions and exclusions just being more widely available. And just, I think because of this, consumers are just more educated about it and are you know, more likely to seek it out. All right, and then speaking of attribute labeling, this certainly is another good one. Here we have the top attributes 
consumers are interested in having in the foods they eat. We can see too right away that these attributes resonate the highest across the board again with millennials. And then overall, it's the attributes that are rich in things that are loved by consumers most. So things like rich in vitamins, high in protein, high in fiber, high in antioxidants. And note too, and actually this was pretty staggering to see in my opinion, attributes like plant-based and plant-forward are appealing to more than half of all millennial consumers, which again, something to keep in mind. All right, but now that we got the diet stuff out of the way, let's look at some more fun ones. So these next slides show a pretty vivid tale of increased, of increased consumer love for food, um, which has emerged since the onset of the pandemic. To kick this section off, we ask consumers, do you consider yourself to be a foodie? And please keep in mind that the word foodie is completely subjective. So really this slide's just meant to be kind of a broad litmus test for consumers' love for food. Um, but this is another one we've trended with past data as well as broken out generationally. And the slide says it well, enthusiasm and passion for food has flourished in recent years. Among US consumers, most see themselves either as a foodie or at least somewhat excited by food. And overall, we've seen this trend increase over the last several years. Um, and I'd say that, you know, there's many new takeaways on this slide, but perhaps the main one is that roughly half of all younger consumers view themselves as foodies. But let's explore this in more concrete detail. Uh, with a quick little stat, just under half of all consumers ate something completely new to them within the past week at the time of taking our survey, survey which to me seems pretty incredible. Looking at this in a little more detail, just as we saw on the last slide, here we asked our consumer respondents, when's the last time you ate something that was completely brand new to you? And just like I said a few slides back, it's definitely younger consumers who spearhead this excitement for new foods, but we also see that 17% of consumers had something new to them that day when they took our survey, which is a dramatic jump from when we asked this question even just last February. But take a look at this for Gen Z and millennials. More than a quarter of them had something new that day when they took our survey. Um, and you know that raises the question of what could be causing this? Here we ask consumers, do you love trying new foods? And we found in our research that in general, eating is becoming more adventurous, which I believe in many ways is influenced by the pandemic. You know, everyone overnight was essentially put into different, different routines when the pandemic broke out. And, um, made food getting more difficult. In many cases, eating at our favorite restaurants became more challenging or temporary, imp temporarily impossible. And really because of this, we've noticed a definite broad increase in consumers' love for food, with it becoming a more love luxury than before. And you know, now more than a third of all consumers say that they love to try new foods, which is up dramatically from when we asked this uh, same question in 2017. But Let's dive into this one uh, more generationally too. Oops. Now, here we have the same question as our slide before, but broken out by generation. And like we've already seen a few times today, it's really the younger consumers who are the most enthusiastic when it comes to trying new foods. And more than half of all millennials outright say they love to eat new foods. But in general, very, very few people say they only prefer foods that are familiar. And again, there's a lot of variance here by generation. But all in all, I believe, you know, it really comes down to in-depth knowledge of one's consumer base um, and just finding that perfect balance between trendy and familiar. Okay, and here's another one that demonstrates increased consumer enthusiasm for food. On this slide, we asked a bunch of perceptual questions in regards to interest in food. And right off the bat, we see that even just between February and October of last year, enthusiasm for different aspects around food pretty much across the board went up considerably. In general, most consumers will go out of the way, out of their way to get food from their favorite places, and more than half always like trying new foods at restaurants. We also see increased enthusiasm for buying new kitchen gadgets like Instant Pots and air fryers. And anecdotally, I know I hear the words like Instant Pot and air fryer just almost every day in different contexts. But then going more into the realms of science fiction, we even see that more than a third of consumers now are open to the idea of eating lab-grown food. So hoping we get some lab-grown filet mignon available soon. All right, but 
<clears throat> Let's take a quick look into consumers' pockets as well as see some new positive insights relating to food service. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. To kick this section off, here we see the weekly consumer budget spend on food, which on average is $125 for consumers. And this is actually something that's declined notably since even just last year in February by 20%. But looking at it generationally, younger consumers, Gen Z's and millennials, they actually share a relatively comparable weekly budget. Then boomers are in line with the overall budget. And then really it's the Gen X consumers that have the most uh, money to spend weekly on food. So overall down a bit over the last year, but relatively high, particularly for many older consumers. But despite what we saw in the last slide, we've also observed a pretty neat, exciting shift. On this slide, we ask consumers, how much of your money spent on food goes to food service versus groceries? Now, what we've observed is that since 2017, money is increasingly shifting more towards food service to the point where now it currently represents nearly a third of all consumers spend on food. And again, it's really the younger consumers that drive this trend. So despite all the craziness over the last two years, there also has been increased ease and availability of ordering food digitally from smart devices. And I really think that's you know, a major factor driving more consumer spend to food service here. Okay, and speaking of food service, We'll dive into some consumer findings when it comes specifically to dining and ordering from restaurants. All right, <clears throat> taking this section off, we see that fewer meals are being prepared at home in spite of the pandemic. So for this one, we ask consumers, overall, what percent of your meals are procured at home versus at a restaurant? And note that a meal delivered to a consumer's door in this instance would actually count as an away from home occasion. So really this slide shows the breakdown between food service and non-food service consumption trended with 2017 data. And what we've observed is that consumers are actually having a higher share of their meals overall originate from food service. And really I see two good reasons here, both of which I've already kind of touched on a bit. Um, one with just so much time at home due to the pandemic, you know, food service is a good chance to shake things up in terms of eating patterns. But secondly, the technology to get food from food service is just so much more widely available and utilized than it was in 2017. Um, so what considerations now factor into where consumers decide to eat? And for this one, we ask consumers, uh, which of these attributes would make you more likely to eat at one restaurant over another? And overall, it's taste and value that are the top considerations uh, factored by consumers. But note that these actually have declined in consumer importance over the last several years. And that's probably due to facts, factors like restaurant closures and maybe just an increased desire for food service in general, you know, regardless of its merits, since it's been harder to get in some cases. Um, but we also see different attributes here resonate more with different generations. And you know, just to give some examples, variety appeals more to Gen Z consumers, and then conversely, taste and value is more attractive to boomers. Um, Gen X resonates a little bit more with name, br name brands. <clears throat> and then millennials are slightly more likely to care about healthy nutritional characteristics and even just the ambiance of a restaurant. Okay, and this is a pretty cool one. Here we ask consumers, how much planning went into your last restaurant meal? And we see that since 2017, the rise of last second decisions on where to eat has grown considerably, now representing actually half of all occasions almost. And actually, this is the case for all generations too, but with the exception of uh, boomers, and you know, they're, they're more likely to plan their restaurant meals in advance. Okay. <clears throat> on this one, we ask consumers, did you eat your last meal from food servers on site or did you take it to go? And back in February of last year, just over a quarter of meals were eaten on site at restaurants and not taken to go. But, you know, jump forward a few months to October, the split has become almost even into half on site and half to go occasions. Eating on site now a bit more prevalent. Um, but my guess now is this has probably slid back a little bit more uh, since October, since Omicron and all that. But regardless, it'll be interesting to uh, monitor this. Uh, just in the future. But 
all in all, I think on-site traffic's can increasingly to flow back um, to restaurants. All right, here we have another cool one. Preferences for digital solutions grew dramatically, especially in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and since the start of the pandemic, this has been a reoccurring theme I've, I've seen so many times in my research. Basically, consumer openness, as well as outright preference for digital tech has grown considerably. And, you know, this makes sense. Um, with all the conditions of the coronavirus pandemic, we had so many first time users um, turning to things like, you know, grocery delivery and digital ordering kiosks, um, you know, non-human interaction ordering methods. And I think, you know, the data here really illustrates this well. We see now nearly a quarter of all consumers outright prefer ordering from a digital device at a restaurant and nearly half prefer self-checkout lanes um, as opposed to having a person ring up the groceries at the store. So really, it'll be interesting to see how much this trend continues. But as this technology becomes more um, available and adopted, it's likely that consumer appeal will continue to grow uh, along with it. But Again, you know, there's a good story here generationally, which we'll take a look at. So here we have the same question as our previous slide, but broken out by generation. And just like we've seen many times today, it's really the younger consumers that have the highest preference for digital ordering. <clears throat> Gen Z consumers who grew up with tech being, you know, more or less ubiquitous than previous generations enjoy it the most, even over millennials who always seem to lead in, you know, excitement for everything. But Really, I think like probably the, you know, the main thing on this slide is just the split with the boomers. Um, more than nine out of 10 just prefer human interaction with ordering. But speaking of technology, let's dive a bit deeper into some tech and automation trends. Oops. And actually all of these slides um, we're about to see come from a research project called the Restaurant of the Future. Um, I did a few months back last year where I tried to envision what restaurants would look like five, 10, and even 20 plus years from now. Um, and, you know, I'm really hoping neon tube lighting comes back in style in restaurants, but, you know, we'll see. Um, but again, all the research, uh, regardless of reports, are available in Data Central's new uh, offering report. All right. So to kick this section off, Acceptance and adoption of automation is heavy, heavily generational. And you know, we've already seen this countless times today, but it's really the younger consumers that are just incredibly more enthused for technology uh, than their older generational counterparts. And you know, like I said, this makes sense. Um, you know, younger folks grew up with these technologies or the precursors, you know, ubiquitous in their lives. And millennials overall, pretty much across the board, um, like these kind of techie things. Um, but like I said, you know, they like everything, essentially. Um, it's really boomers who, in general, have the most apprehension overall. But that makes a sense, uh, again, too, as, you know, a lot of these forms of technology emerged towards the latter parts of their uh, time in the workforce or after. Um, so next up, here we have automation currently fits best with quick and convenient food service meals. And... Cool techie things like robots, drones, and digital ordering from kiosks, um, they make getting a quick meal from a restaurant easy, convenient, fun. But, you know, if you take like something, maybe like an occasion like a, an older relative's birthday at a independent mid-scale restaurant, a robot's going to be out of place in an occasion like that. So more or less, um, the current state of automation really fits best with more casual on-the-go uh, quick eating occasions. And, you know, this is kind of reflected in the uh, consumer uh, data we see here as well. Um, you know, consumers see meals in and on the go and meant to be just a quick bite as essentially the most appropriate occasions for automation in food service currently. All right, and here we have a cool slide. And this one is trended with data from 2019. We ask consumers, how much automation is used at the restaurants you visit? And as we can see, there's been a massive jump in exposure to restaurant automation just in this two, two three year time frame. Um, and again, you know, this was largely accelerated by coronavirus. Um, I see we only have a few more minutes, so I'm gonna just cruise for these last few techie ones. So on this slide, um, you know, it's just like the other one, we gauged 
entrenched consumer affinity and perception of automation um, in regards to the specifically the restaurant experience. And just like we saw in the last slide, just in a few years, we see a massive jump in affinity for restaurant automation, um, as well as an increased positive perception of just automation's role within the dining experience. All right, now looking into back of house operations, here we see consumer affinity for back of house, house automation, as well as the overall level of concern when it comes to um, just worries about automation replacing traditional jobs. And, all in all, we see that, you know, while affinity for backup house automation has grown among consumers, so is the concern that, you know, these types of technologies are going to replace people's jobs. And, you know, we actually see that playing out on this slide is um, with this robot taking this man's uh, briefcase. All right. And the, in my opinion, uh, the finding on this one's pretty crazy. On this one, we ask consumers, of all your purchasing from restaurants over the last year, what percent overall was placed digitally versus non-digitally? And I remember just being floored when I saw this. Um, so while most orders are still placed using traditional methods, like you know, uh, calling a place on the phone, digital restaurant orders now represent a massive portion of orders overall for restaurants, 43%. And I think, you know, really, really, perhaps more than anything else um, I'm gonna share today, it just shows us just how digital our industry has become in a short time frame. And building on that previous uh, take, here on this one, we ask consumers, do you see ordering from restaurants in the next upcoming two years being more digital, more traditional, or staying the same as it currently is for you? And what we see is that actually more than nine out of 10 consumers overall plan to either increase their digital ordering or just keep it at the same level. But, um, oh, and another thing not pictured on this slide, you know, just like all the other generational breakouts we've seen, totally varies by generation with younger consumers um, being much more likely to place uh, more orders digitally in the future. Um, and then, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, actually boomers in some cases anticipate uh, placing more orders traditionally. So we'll see, it'll be interesting just to see um, how that plays out in the future. But um, coming to the end here, I'm just gonna go through some ghost kitchen insights. Oops. Okay, so uh, here are some perceptual questions we asked uh, consumers during pop about ghost, kitchen, ghost kitchens. And, um, you know, overall, consumers think ghost kitchens are cool. They think they're going to last in the long run. And actually, they'd be likely to support a local restaurant that they liked that was forced to close if it was to reemerge as a delivery only uh, ghost kitchen. So, really, some positive sentiment all around. But Really, with that being said, uh, we do see some apprehension. Um, and this really comes down to if restaurants were to rebrand their offerings under a different name as a ghost kitchen and didn't overtly advertise it as such. Um, and that you know, is a good segue into this one, um, which shows us that really consumers in general, they've liked the idea of ghost kitchens, but the majority of them want uh, transparency. Um, most want to know if a restaurant's virtually only, as well as be informed on um, you know, specifically what location is um, their food being prepared at. And, you know, it's really just 14% of consumers overall that think that, you know, ghost kitchens don't need to do any of these things. And, you know, I kind of find that a bit surprising. Um, I think it would be higher than 14%, but I think, you know, it'll probably, I think the apprehension will probably fade away is just more uh, consumers become more familiar. All right. So I know I'm right at the end here on time, but I'm just going to get through the, or we just got to just a hand feel more. And I'm just going to um, go through some kind of, you know, really high level uh, takeaways that, you know, if you remember anything after these slides, these are, these are some good, uh, just good talking points. Um, and, you know, the first up thing up is uh, the only thing that doesn't change is change. And, you know, it's super cliche thing to say, but definitely it rings true. And I think, you know, in a lot of the research data central it's done over the last year, you know, that captures the spirit of it pretty well. Um, tech innovation, pandemics, shifting desires of consumers, shifting demographics, you know, all of these things are forces um, that just keep the wheels of society turning. And it's useful to look to the past for insight, but, you know, that attitude of this is how we've always done it, you know, eventually is susceptible to um, new ways from competition. So in other words, you know, it's good to be open and adaptable. 
uh, to change. And this is another good one. So unpredictable events will accelerate adoption. And, you know, we saw, you know, in all of these slides, so many examples of the direct effects of this today. You know, none of us probably could have uh, predicted what was going to occur over the last two years. Um, and, you know, if, you know, we can say anything about it. It definitely spurred massive increases um, in adoption of automation technology and digital solutions in our industry. All right, and lastly, be mindful of the past, but leap forward unhindered. And really, you know, everything's constantly in motion. Um, like I said before, it's very valuable to look at past trends and, you know, everything we just looked at from these slides, they're all insights from the past compared from insights from the, even, you know, even further back. Um, but, you know, we like to say data essential, you know, innovation is a must for long-term successful growth. and. I'll end on this note. Um, I cut this verbiage on the slide out for today's presentation, but it originally quoted Lao Tzu, shape clay into a vessel. It's the empty space within that makes it useful. But with that being said, that's all I got. And happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Awesome, yeah, I've got a question to start with. Um, uh, transparency, when you talked about that in regards to uh, ghost tipping, um, is there anything that you have that's more in-depth as to why? Is it about food safety? What are the other reasons that, um, you know, that, that the consumers were saying that they, yeah, they, they want to know where the food's coming from, even if it's a different concept? That's a great question. You know, I, and I was surprised to see that, like, consumers were so apprehensive because, you know, in my mind, if you can order from somewhere easily on your phone and it tastes good, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, the, the general population places a ton of emphasis on that detail. I think it's going to erode just as it becomes, you know, more of a commonplace thing. It's, a, it's an emerging trend uh, and segment for sure. I think it really comes down to just want, wanting to know where their dollars are going to um, specifically. Um, you know, if they're, they find a restaurant they really like and find out, you know, it's actually just, you know, a, a major national brand, um, you know, just with a, under a different name, but still made in the same kitchens. I think, you know, pe people still have to warm up to that idea, essentially. Some people. Cool. And actually, and I, if I could just add, that's also very generationally, uh, a very generational thing, too. Uh, younger consumers, way more open to the idea. That's cool. That's probably a great segue into Louise. And also, I want to mention everybody here that's, you know, that's a, a panelist and a participant right now. Uh, feel free to ask questions. This is a flow of conversation to go along. So if you have a question for Gerald now, ask him. I want to go to Luis now because it's a perfect segue into, uh, you know, you've done so much with Ghost Kitchens. You were on with us uh, in webinars, you know, last year and talked about the great success you guys had with three different brands. And, you know, so talk about that. And if you want to get into the transparency thing, too, that would be interesting as well. Yeah, no, that's a great segue. You know, uh, one of our um, <clears throat> ghost kitchens that we have is called Roadie Sliders. And basically is making, you know, sandwiches, sliders from or yeast rolls, you know, so people know Logan's because of the yeast rolls, you know. Uh, prior to the pandemic, it was the peanuts. And since we took the peanuts away, now is the rolls, right? The yeast rolls. So people know that about us. And when they know that, um, you know, it says, you know, sponsored by Logan's Roadhouse. So people click those two things, right? They're like, I like the Logan's Roadhouse rolls. And I also like these new things that I can't get in the restaurant, right? So we were doing some things like, you know, we had a salmon roti, we had um, a meatloaf roti that, you know, move on to the menu. We had uh, pulled pork. I mean, we had a brisket one. So we had different ideas that, you know, people, you know, people are not dumb, right? People knew that they they, they can't get those in the restaurant. And uh, a few instances, you know, we, we told them those are only available through online um, and you can't get them in the restaurant. So that kind of gave us, um, you know, letting people know that it was sponsored by Logan's, it did help a lot. Uh, we tried the same concept in one of our sister brands on Rock Bottom, and it didn't do as well, you know, because, you know, the restaurants where those are, uh, they didn't know Logan's, right? So they didn't care about the Logan's yeast rolls because they weren't familiar with the brand. Uh, prime examples in Denver, you know, we had that brand and it just didn't do as well. Uh, but, you know, we're 
Logan's is known like here in Nashville, you know, we are very successful to it, you know, and then speaking about the brands, you know, we have three ghost kitchens running out of Logan's, uh, Rody sliders. Uh, we have, um, twisted tenders. That's just, uh, you know, chicken tenders. And then we have our latest one, Ember smoke, which is, you know, everything, uh, smoked meats you know you have ribs you have brisket pulled pork and sort of those things so that's been the most successful as 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 of now we kind of tease everybody Luis, about some of the numbers you know if you don't mind sharing it's like share like the peak and maybe yeah, around when that yeah. happened and where you are today last year we peaked at over at three million dollars just in you know logan's uh between all the three brands, you know, over $3 million. Uh, I'm looking at the numbers right now. That was over $3 million. So it's $3 million that, you know, three and a half million dollars that, you know, it's basically having another restaurant. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it starts high, people ordering, you know, uh, and then it just kind of flattens and then it starts dying. So, you know, right now we're working on rebranding or re uh, revamping those menus just to give some more new news to that. And just like in the restaurant, right? You just got to keep something new coming. Uh, but we know that that um, every brand, every uh, ghost kitchen that we have done, it starts high and then it's just flattens and then it's, it takes a plunge. Uh, I wouldn't say a plunge, it just dies a little bit. Uh, but Ember Smoke, it has maintained uh, uh, the same volume. Uh, Twisted Tenders has been a little bit flat, and then Rotis has it has a little bit flat now. Uh, but uh, we think, uh, you know, when we launched Ember Smoked, which it was around the summertime, I mean, we couldn't keep ribs in, in the restaurant because they were so, you know, we're selling so many of them. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, up to the first, I'm looking at the uh, this year so far, we have done almost a half a million dollars on those three brands. So it adds up. I mean, it's extra money that, you know, the restaurants sell quickly, you know? That's awesome. Anybody else want to chime in on this, on ghost kitchens before we move on to something else or virtual kitchens either? Yeah, I'm doing a lot of work in that space too. Um, uh, part of what I was going to add on later is, you know, I th traditionally, like we know as a big organizations of restaurateurs, they're really risk averse and like inhibited from like doing, you know, things like this. And I think the pandemic really kind of forced people to be more open to it and realize that they they have this asset on the books and these buildings that are static, like they're there, they have labor in them. And you know, if you come up with something that is uh, not too crazy to add on top of when it comes to SKUs or equipment or adding bodies, and you can get some of this extra revenue, it's really beneficial if you have an underperforming restaurant. So, you know, we're, uh, I'm going up to Toledo uh, next month and, you know, looking at a concept that has a few locations and also has a commissary, which is a big upside, right? Because now we can make some manufacture, you know, make some, uh, uh, some, you know, items that we don't have to go to try and get a manufacturer to make. We can make small batches of a sauce or something unique um, from a kind of uh, commissary standpoint to feed these restaurants with as a test product, right? And so, it's really about kind of finding the you know operators that are open to it and doing it. So you know this is a, a fairly independent group and good operators. So they they're a great candidate for you know trying to uh, establish some brands, you know some fun ideas. Um, and for us, we're kind of looking at it like a uh, we're going to own it and let them use it and have it, and it'll be kind of a test space, you know, where we try it out but we don't have to buy the space, right? So then it's, you know, something that we can then go and, you know, try out in other places. So uh, I just, I, I like the idea that this pandemic has been a disruptor. So it's it's opened up these possibilities of these things that people would have not been open to before. Great point. Hey, Wolves, you want to chime in on some of this stuff from uh, Inspire and what you Yeah, we, 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 
Uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, we started a virtual brand last year that was based on our uh, on our entire burger platform. And it netted out basically uh, about $1,000 a week to the bottom line per restaurant, you know, times 1,300 restaurants. Uh, you know, it adds up pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, obviously everything there was done through, you know, either a Grubhub or a DoorDash or something like that. <clears throat> and we thought, you know, we might try to still capitalize on that. We actually tried to launch a second virtual brand earlier this year uh, and we couldn't get any velocity on it. Um, I'm not going to really get into why, but the, the we're, we're kind of looking at it in reverse now. Now we're going to launch it in the restaurants, get some velocity there, and then we're going to launch it back into the virtual brand soon. Um, but it, it shows uh, what some of what Gerald was talking about. There is a little bit of a change that's happening uh, dine-in. And so, the dine-in thing has definitely happened for us, especially if you think about us. Super Bowl, that's really big for us. Obviously, a lot of that is also takeout too. But because uh, there is a slight change in that, uh, and we're kind of we're up on the year for sure right now, uh, and compared to dine-in between last year, obviously. Um, and we see the uptick actually not changing for us. We we don't see it leveling out yet. We see that it's still gonna it's still gonna continue. Uh, virtual brand, and we also have a ghost kitchen too. Now our ghost kitchen, we just have one large ghost kitchen that represents all of the brands in one facility called Alliance Kitchen, and that's here in Atlanta. And uh, it's interesting; it's it's pretty relatively new. It's it's only about six or eight months old right now, uh, but it's also gaining steam in the Atlanta area. I'm, there's there's all sorts of questions like uh, ROI questions and things of that nature, trying to figure out like, well, what what is it going to become? What are we going to do with it? I think we're still trying to figure that out. I'm not going to call it an experiment because I, I think that it's actually doing stuff. But there is one interesting thing that did happen recently that I heard wind of and that we opened what we call a Go brand uh, a Buffalo Wild Wings. So Buffalo Wild Wings Go, which is a smaller version of our current restaurants are not dining restaurants there. They're actually made for picking up food. And we started that pre-pandemic. It was already online to start. And, you know, obviously the pandemic kicked it into a little bit of a higher gear of, of opening more of those restaurants. But we opened one and on the Georgia Tech campus recently. Uh, and we are trying to figure out where the line was, where the Alliance Kitchen is uh, and the Go Kitchen is so that we don't have any crossover of somebody ordering from one place versus another place. And I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting problem to have, trying to figure out the logistics. And they figured it out through technology of making sure uh, the guests were pushed into the right place uh, for ordering purposes. So a car wasn't driving across town, for example. That's cool. Yeah, that sounds really cool. So on that front, so we're getting into the uh, sales side of things. Alex, you want to chime in a little bit and talk about, you know, what's going on in your world and how crazy the sales increases are? Yeah. And I think it's a good segue, Kevin, because part of it, because we're up so much and because sales are so crazy, we've kind of paused all of the virtual kitchen and ghost stuff uh, to really try and protect what we got happening in the four walls. Um, just over last year, um, or kind of, I guess, yeah, last year, we're already up 22%. Over 19, we're up almost 40%. That's averaged wow. out over the entire system. So it is an insane growth when we were already stacked really large. And it's not coming in any one category either. We've kind of maintained our bar sales, maintained our food sales too. It's great growth. And with everything else going on, including opening up new restaurants that are massive and way busier than any of our others too. We're like, why mess around with all the virtual kitchens and trying to get at, at extra sales when I'm just holding on for dear life, really <laughs> in the restaurants, you know? Um, but it's going really great because of that. Uh, it's really driven a lot more franchisees looking at us. It drove uh, our acquisition by fat brands as well. Um, which was, a, you know, a huge deal for us. Um, and access to all of their current franchisees as well. So, I mean, our pipeline filled up extremely quickly. They're, they have deals signed now for 220 more additional stores in the U.S. We have 22 that are in uh, permitting or current construction. So that pretty much means for this year, we'll end up with 22 more openings. Um, we're going to end up starting some stuff that's new for us. You know, some of these guys... 
um, on the call are really used to it, but we'll end up starting to do five or six openings per month. Um, so simultaneous openings across the country, including a couple international. Um, we were looking at Poland. Uh, I don't think that's on the board anymore with what's going on. Uh, we're opening up a couple other countries as well. And next year's already filling up too. It's looking like it's going to be about 35 openings for us then. So you're talking uh, about a 25% growth in the units alone. Uh, and next year, it'll probably be an additional 20 to 25% of total units going as well. So huge jumps. Everybody's making a bunch of money. Um, we really haven't seen any problems with finding real estate and finding people that are interested in converting over current restaurants or doing ground up buildings with us too. Um, and I know we are kind of all waiting during COVID for like what was going to happen to all the independent restaurants. We're seeing that they've actually kind of hung around, especially near us, near our locations. Um, after at least that first wave of closures, um, we're seeing legacy chain restaurants converting over to our brand. So it's not the independent guy on the corner that we're really going with. It's more of, um, you know, the, the 20, 30, 40 year old chain restaurants that go, hey, these guys are making a pretty big splash out there. What happens if we switch to them and what's that look like for our profitability? And it's going really well. They're extremely happy. We're doing great. So just kind of one of those things of hold on for dear life. <laughs> That's awesome. And now we're going to go to RJ after this because I know you guys work together on some things. And I'll bring that you know together. But um, I've got a question for you. So last year when you talked, a lot of what your growth was is because you had basically the, you know, instead of being sandwiched into a couple of meal periods, you know, because of people working from home, it extended the day. So you had a lot of, you know, mid-afternoon business and all of that. Is that still the same? Yes. And really... Now we're end capping it. We're we're capturing more lunch as opposed to like the afternoon and late nights going insanely well. Um, and not just drinking late night, it's people that are eating late. Um, and I think you can kind of see that from a lot of the staffing shortages that other restaurants have had and they're closing earlier. We haven't had that staffing shortage, um, especially in the hourly ranks for our company. And then we've held out. We're serving food till 1 a.m. or 2 a.m everywhere so the traditional to-go food late night for us insane once like 1 a.m comes around you're probably getting five or six uber orders off the bat and it's going to keep going all night while your restaurant is still full so we're actually to the point where we're allowing the operators to turn it off to try and protect that experience in the restaurant if they're getting run over you know what we're not going to serve the uber people and have them have a bad experience we'll just take care of the people in the restaurant that makes a lot of sense yeah, it does. So, yeah, it's kind of like turn over to you and RJ. Uh, talk a little bit about it. You guys did a, a huge fry promotion and just went crazy, right? Talk a little bit about that, both of you. RJ, you want to jump in? You're muted. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yep. That's it's right. interesting listening to, you know, everything that Alex is going through. Of course, those are the challenges every operator wishes they had. Right. Um, but it also sets the tone of how do we make it operationally feasible? And so that's really what we wanted to do was to be a support system for not just Twin Peaks, but for all sorts of food service brands out there uh, and showcasing how you know potatoes in general can be a great operational solve. Um, you know, it's a skew that everybody already has. Uh, it lends itself very well to menu innovation, and it's something that customers love. And so when you couple all of those things together, along with the reduced labor uh, um, constraints of it as a product, um, I think that that just kind of naturally falls in synergy with everything that was going on at the time. And so Alex, uh, Alex and I kind of collaborated on some of these items. He, he went to work with his team and came up with some incredible, incredible menu items utilizing potatoes in these little loaded fry dishes and they just took off like like a bat out of hell it's been really really great yeah and i really think the, the biggest thing rj right besides that you know it tastes great it was that the no skews added meant that there was no pushback at all from any of the operators any of the franchise groups anything like that and it just really delivered like a fastball down the middle 
is exactly what we needed at that time. I think we struck at the right time, and it's been incredible for us. Especially when you're like, how much money did you make off of selling French fries? Right? And especially by the unit, that's a serious return. Right? We're only at 89 units, and now we're about to eclipse $6 million just in those loaded fries. That's a pretty big splash. <laughs> And you also you, you can't can't forgo talking about you know the fact that there's no staff little to no staff training added. They already are familiar with these SKU items. They're already familiar with how to fry up fries. Now it's just assembly, and boom, you've got four great new menu options out there for your guests. And it's not the end either, right? The the whole idea is that it's a platform that we can keep tweaking it, changing it, new sauces, all that sort of beautiful photos you always post. I mean, on Instagram and and on Facebook, and we can just tweak that and try and see what else we can get. Use that as kind of an entryway, like Dave was talking about, a different way, right? Like we do a new sauce, use the the loaded fries to get some velocity to it, and then put it elsewhere on the menu, and then we're just making more money and being way more efficient. Absolutely, that's awesome. And uh, RJ, we'll come back because I I want to talk about your new website too that you guys just created. But while we're on this subject of, of new menu development and some success stories, uh, Louise, Dave, you know, uh, Eric, what what comes to mind for you guys? What's some stuff you've done recently to just like where those home runs? I mean, for us, it's, it's kind of like those dishes that I said that um, they were great in the uh, ghost kitchens you know we brought them up to the menu just to get some more velocity you know they took off on on the ghost kitchens uh the meatloaf sandwich is prime example of that you know uh, uh already skus we already had in house and they did so well that you know which that we for us it was easier just to grab those items and move them on to uh the menu um so we've done that with a couple of the dishes uh a couple menu additions uh but, you know, again, we are being careful as, you know, supply chain issues uh, are out there. Uh, you know, we're being really, really thoughtful on what we put on the menu just because, you know, sometimes we talk to suppliers and they're like, we can, you know, supply you for, you know, until next year, you know. So so we're being cautious on that just because we don't want to put something on and then three months later be like, oh, we're out, so we got to take it off. So so we're being cautious on that end, but at the same time, just trying to use what we have in-house. It's like we have a really good friend here who's got an Irish pub, and he just said, I didn't want to do a burger. You know, it's like that's just not, doesn't fit, you know, because most of their food's pretty authentic, but they wanted, and they know the success. They did like you did. They did a meatloaf sandwich, and it just took off. Like, went crazy. Man, it's simple food, you know. Sometimes uh, simple yeah. food is what the guests want, you know. Yeah. Eric or Dave, anything you guys want to chime in on that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we, um, I, I, Alex was kind of talking about is something I've been trying to do is um, like stick to what they're already good at, like what you're good at. Like that's one of the other things about the the pandemic is you know, people shrunk their menus and got down to the brass tacks. And I think, you know, as people come out of this, I, I hear, oh, well, let's do this. Let's do this. And I, my, my whole thing is like, no, like you're really good at pizza. Let's not put pasta on your menu. Let's make cooler pizzas. Like, let's stretch that out there, trying to get people to do, you know, maybe they bring in a, 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 a Snake River Farms Sopracetta, right? Something ingredient wise that is just a real highlight name brand raises the bar of something versus trying to complicate it. It's like, wait a minute, you're still shorthanded. You still like, you know, have a hard time just putting this out. Let's just like put an ingredient or something flavor wise or a sauce like those guys were talking about, um, you know, doing loaded tots at a place that already did them. Okay. Let's do kimchi and spicy ketchup on there. Right. Like, already uh, a you know a product that's already produced and you know put cilantro on it and all of a sudden you got kimchi covered tots right or korean tots so just finding easy ways to take what they're already good at and make that you know without making it overly complicated and i, I i've been trying to do more ingredient driven stuff uh you know to you know maybe it's just one new sku or two but without complicating it on the prep or production side it just seems to be the what you got to do awesome well yeah I, and i and i 
you know, you, you talked about TOTS, like we, we, we launched the top platform last year that's been super successful for us and totally agree. Uh, go simple, try to be as simplistic as you possibly can uh, and the ingredients that you have, let the ingredient shine itself. Uh, but, you know, I know it says wings in the name of our brand, but we're really a sauce company. <laughs> I mean, we use wings to deliver sauce to people and we have a lot of sauces and dry rubs on our menu. Uh, and probably the single biggest thing that we did uh, in, in that world is we, uh, we, we launched a, um, a spicy Dorito, uh, sweet chili Dorito wing earlier this year that was incredibly successful. We were out before, I mean, <laughs> in weeks we were pretty much out. So uh, bad on us. I don't know. I don't. I think it was actually a good problem to have uh, to be out so soon. But it was it was so incredible. We're going to try to re replicate that again with uh, with another Dorito flavor. So be be on the lookout for that. Very cool. So uh, RJ, back to you. Talk to us a little bit about your uh, you know, potato goodness website that you just you launched today, right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, hot off the press. Uh, we had a really dynamic website before. This one's just a lot more clean, uh, simplified, really to help deliver solutions for all of you, right? So um, if you go to potatogoodness.com and you click at the top right, you'll see a little tab that says professionals. Scroll down to food service. Um, when you click on food service, immediately you see um, documents for support from the U.S. potato industry. Um, there's information on different potato types that are out there. There's also a lot of inspirational guides as well as operational solutions, right? So we've got like a fry guide that is available. So you can share this with your teams uh, to showcase how to properly uh, not only uh, prepare, prepare fries, but also great tips on how to deliver them successfully and keep them crispy and and all sorts of little things like that in addition to all the wonderful inspiration that we continue to try and provide but again what we've done with our development and, and we showcase it through our through our food photography on our site is really to look at what you guys are going through on a daily basis and understand the operational challenges and translate that into a recipe that you guys can look at and be like, oh yeah, we could easily put something like that on our menu tomorrow. Because for us, the biggest thing is, is not only obviously getting potatoes on our menus, but we want to make it so that it eases the strain that you guys are going through every single day so that we can lift some of the burden off of you and offer some of those benefits. You know, we've got a great team here. We've got a brand new test kitchen. So if at any point in time, you all wanna collaborate, showcase, um, you know, some new items, take that lift off of your team, we can do the development on our end. We can develop, we can deliver that innovation onto our website as well and provide it for more folks in the industry, not with your branded concepts, but with just potato gener uh, potato inspiration in general. Um, you know, uh, we, Eric was talking about the Korean tots, for example. You know, it's so easy for us to continue to build upon that idea that we're now not looking at just putting more recipes on our site. We're looking at how do we flip that on its head and accompany great content with a stellar recipe, right? So if there's an operational solve out there, here's five recipes that help you attack that operational challenge. Awesome. So well, that's cool. We're getting close to time here. So I just throw it out now. Anybody have any final thoughts you want to share? And then we're going to go to, we have a video, of course, we end our, all of our webinars with, but I appreciate all the, you know, input and, and feedback. It's been great, but any thoughts? I was just looking on your site, um, on your potatoes. That's, that's cool. Uh, I saw your uh, Okonomiyaki. I actually did uh, uh, something similar with Tots. I did it called a Tokyo bacon and egg. And it's a, uh, it's a basically, you know, a fried egg, furikake, spicy mayo and the and the um the eel sauce on there so very similar to that it's fun that's awesome i love that those are all my flavors in my playground so i, I love that <laughs> style of food um going on talking about potatoes i just had to take a look we have a database where we track uh consumer affinity for 4100 different foods beverages ingredients dishes everything you can imagine and potatoes is the 11th most loved food, beverage, whatever item uh, out of all of those. So people love potatoes. That's awesome. I'll co-sign on that. <laughs> <laughs>
with her rookie numbers. We've got to pump those up, RJ. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure, that, I'm pretty sure Bourbon's on that list, too. So Bourbon probably is a little higher than uh, Sato's for some reason. <laughs> with this group. <laughs> Cool. Well, thanks everyone. And, and thanks to everybody out there as attendees too. Thanks for being on with us today on our first one. Any feedback you have, we are going to continue this. It'll be the first Tuesday of every month uh, going forward. And uh, again, it'll be a different format and we'll have different uh, people on, but appreciate Data Central. Thank you so much, uh, Gerald, for that information. It was awesome. It'll be up on the website. Um, hopefully it should be by Friday, if not by next week. Uh, we'll get the uh, video up and we'll also have a link to the uh, um, to his presentation. But uh, with that being said, we're going to close out with our video. Thanks to Mike and uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate it. We will see you here next month. Have a good evening.